So one of the things you've done is uh, simulated the formation of stars. How difficult do you think it is to simulate the formation of planets, like simulate a solar system the, through the entire evolution of the solar system? This is kind of a, a numerical simulation sneaking up to the question of how many planets are there. That actually we're able to do now. There is, you can run simulations of the formation of planetary system. So if you run the simulation, you, really where you want to start is a cloud of gas, these giant interstellar clouds of gas that may have, you know, a million times the mass of the sun in them. And so you run a simulation of that. It's turbulent. The gas is roiling and tumbling. And every now and then you get a place where the, uh, the gas is dense enough that gravity gets hold of it and it can pull it downward. So you'll start to form a protostar. And a protostar is basically the young star of the, you know, this ball of gas where uh, nuclear reactions are getting started. But it's also a disk. So you, as material falls inward, because it's, everything's rotating, as it falls inward, it'll spin up and then it'll form a disk. Material will collect in what's called an accretion disk or a protoplanetary disk. And you can simulate all of that. Once you get into the disk itself and you want to do planets, things get a little bit more complicated because the physics gets more complicated. Now you got to start worrying about dust because actually dust, which is just, dust is the wrong word. It's smoke, really. These are the tiniest bits of solids. They will coagulate in the disk to form pebbles, right? And then the pebbles will collide to form rocks and then the rocks will form boulders, et cetera, et cetera. That process is super complicated, but we've been able to simulate enough of it to begin to get a handle on how planets form, how you accrete enough material to get the first proto planets or planetary embryos, uh, as we call them. And then, then some, the next step is those things start slamming into each other to form, you know, planetary sized bodies. And then the planetary bodies slam into each other. Earth, the moon came about because there was a Mars sized body that slammed into the earth and basically blew off all the material that uh, then eventually formed the moon. And all of them have uh, different chemical compositions, different temperatures. Yeah, so the, the the temperature of the material in the disk depends on how far away you are from the star. It. So it decreases, right? And so there's a really interesting point. So like, you know, close to the star, temperatures are really high. And the only thing that can condense, that can kind of freeze out, is going to be stuff like metals. So that's why you find mercury is this giant ball of iron, basically. And then as you go further out, stuff, you know, the gas gets cooler, and now you can start getting things like water to freeze, right? So there's something we call the snow line, which is somewhere in our solar system out around between Mars and Jupiter. And that's the reason why the giant planets in our solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, um, Uranus, and Neptune all have huge amounts of ice in them, or water and ice. Um, actually, Jupiter and Saturn don't have so much, but the moons do. The moons have so much water in them that there's there's oceans, right? That we've got a number of those moons have got more water on them than there's water on Earth. Do you think it's possible to do that kind of simulation to have a stronger and stronger estimate of uh, how likely an Earth-like planet is? Can we get the physics simulation done well enough to where we can start estimating, like, what are the possible Earth-like things that could be generated? Yeah, I think we can. I think we're learning how to do that now. Um, so, you know, one part is like trying to just figure out how to how planets form themselves and doing the simulations. Like that, that cascade from uh, dust grains up to planetary yeah. embryos. That's hard to simulate because it's both, you got to do both the gas and you got to do the dust and the dust colliding and all that physics. Um, once you get up to a planet sized body, then, you know, you kind of have to switch over to almost like a different kind of simulation there. Often what you're doing is you're doing, you know, sort of, you're assuming the planet is this sort of spherical ball. And then you're doing what, you know, like a 1D, a radial calculation. And you're just asking like, all right. How is this thing going to, what is the structure of it going to be? Like, am I going to have a solid iron core or am I going to get a solid iron core with that liquid iron core out around it like we have on, on earth? And then you get, you know, a silicate kind of a rocky mantle and then a crust, all of those details, those are kind of beyond being able to do full 3D simulations from ab initio, from scratch. We're not there yet. Uh, how important are those details, like the crust and the atmosphere, do you think? Hugely important. So I I'm part of a collaboration at the University of Rochester where we're using uh, the giant laser. It's literally, this is called the Laboratory for Laser Energetics. We got a huge grant from the NSF to use that laser to like 
slam tiny pieces of silica to understand what the conditions are like at, you know, the center of the earth, or even more importantly, the center of super earths, like the most com this is what's wild. The most common kind of planet in the universe we don't have in our solar system, which is amazing, right? So the, uh, we've been able to study enough or observe enough planets now to get a census. You know, we pretty, you know, we kind of have an idea yeah. of what who's average, who's weird. Um, and our solar system's weird because the average planet has a mass between somewhere between a few times the mass of the earth to maybe, you know, 10 times the mass of the earth. And that's exactly where there are no planets in our solar system. So, um, the smaller ones of those we call super earths, the larger ones we call sub Neptunes. And they're anybody's guess. Like, we don't really know what happens to material when you're squeezed to those pressures, which is like millions, tens of millions of times the, the pressure on the surface of the earth. So those details really will matter of what's going on in there because that will determine whether or not you have, say, for example, plate tectonics. We think plate tectonics may have been really important for life on earth, for the evolution of complex life on earth. So it turns out and this is sort of the next generation where we're going with the, the understanding the evolution of planets and life. It turns out that you actually have to think hard about the planetary context for life. You can't just be like, oh, there's a warm pond, you know, and then some interesting, you know, chemistry happens in the warm pond. You actually have to think about the planet as a whole and what it's gone through in order to really understand whether a planet is a good place for life or not.